Good morning. My name is Maurice Turner. As you know, the election may be over, but its shadow still remains. For the last year, election security has been a leading concern for governments and constituents. Pitt practitioners have been right in the thick of it, working to staunch disinformation, protect voting infrastructure, and to make a path to make the polls, getting to the polls easier. Today, our speakers are going to discuss the role of Pitt in election security, what we've learned during this election cycle, and how we can make use of the information in the future. Again, my name is Maurice Turner. I'm an election security expert. I've recently been working at the Election Assistance Commission, but I've also had roles in the nonprofit sector as well. So we're going to jump right into this. Let's start off with our first panelist, Robin Carnahan. She's a fellow at the Beek Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University. She's the former Secretary of State of Missouri and founded and led the state and local practice at 18F, a tech consultancy inside the U.S. Government General Services Administration. She's a nationally recognized government technology leader and in 2017 was named one of the federal government's top women in tech. Her lifelong passion for improving how people experience and value their government inspires her to work helping governments get the digital tools they need to deliver digital services to people that are better, faster, and cheaper. As Secretary of State, Carnahan co-chaired both the Elections and Securities Committee of the National Association of Secretaries of State, and today serves on a number of corporate and nonprofit boards, including the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs, where she co-chairs the Technology Committee and has led and participated in international election observer delegations in more than 20 countries. We also have Bruce Schneier. Bruce Schneier is an internationally renowned security technologist called a security guru by The Economist. He is the author of 14 books, including the New York Times bestseller, Data and Goliath, The Hidden Battles to Collect Your Data and Control Your World, as well as hundreds of articles, essays, and academic papers. His influential newsletter, Cryptogram, and blog, Schneier on Security, are read by over 250,000 people. Schneier is a fellow at the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, a fellow at the Belfer Center at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and a board member of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He is also a special advisor to IBM Security and the Chief Technology Officer of Resilient. Next, let me introduce Rich DeMilo. He is the chair of the School of Cybersecurity and Privacy and the Charlotte B. and Roger C. Warren Professor of Computing at Georgia Tech. He was formerly the John P. Imlay Dean of Computing. Positions he has held prior to joining Georgia Tech include Chief Technology Officer for Hewlett Packard, Vice President of Computing Research for Bell Communications Research, Director of the Computer Research Division for the National Science Foundation, and Director of the Test Soft software test and evaluation project for the Office of the Secretary of Defense. He has also held faculty positions at the University of Wisconsin, Purdue University, and the University of Padua, Italy. His research includes over 100 articles, books, and patents in software and computer engineering, cryptography, cybersecurity, and theoretical computer science. In 1982, he wrote the first policy for testing software intensive systems for the US Department of Defense. Milo and his collaborators launched and developed the field of program mutation for hardware for software testing. He is a co-inventor of differential fault cryptanalysis and holds what is believed to be the only patent on breaking public key crypto systems. He currently works in the area of election and voting system security. His work has been cited in court cases, including 2019 and 2020 federal court decisions declaring the unconstitutional use of paperless voting machines. He has served as a foreign election observer for the Carter Center and is a member of the State of Michigan Election Security Commission. He has also served on boards of public and private cybersecurity and privacy companies, including RSA Security and SecureWorks. He has served on many nonprofit and philanthropic boards, including Exploratorium and the Campus Community Partnership Foundation. He is a fellow of both the Association of Computing Machinery and the American Association of Advancement of Sciences. Jake Braun is also joining us today. He is Executive Director of the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy's Cyber Policy Initiative, where he works at the Center of Politics, Technology, and National Security to advance the field of cyber policy. 
He is the author of Democracy in Danger, How Hackers and Activists Exposed Fatal Flaws in the Election System, and has co-authored two award-winning and seminal works on the election infrastructure, Cyber Vulnerabilities. In addition to his role at Harris, Mr. Braun is co-founder of the DEF CON Voting Machine Hacking Village in the President Circle on the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and a strategic advisor to the Department of Homeland Security and the Pentagon on Cyber Security. Prior to joining University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy faculty, Mr. Braun was appointed by President Obama as White House liaison to the Department of Homeland Security and served on the presidential transition team for the Obama administration as deputy director for the National Security Agency's review. He holds an MA in International Relations from Troy State University, an MA in Education from National Louis University in Chicago, and a BA in Philosophy from Loyola University of Chicago. Our panelists have quite a depth of experience in this field, and we're gonna jump right into what does it mean for elections in 2020 in America? How are they different from what we've seen in the international democracies around the world, and how do they work? Robin? Well, thanks very much, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. It's been uh, just over a week since the biggest election turnout we've had in, in uh, decades um, in the middle of a global pandemic. So it's a rather remarkable place that we find ourselves in. Uh, this was set up to be a hotly contested election even before the pandemic, and if you think about how elections are run, they're kind of a miracle in and of themselves because you have you know, more or less 150 million people wanting to do the same thing on the same day. And if you think about it like a business, it's as if all your customers might show up on one day and you know they won't, but you have to be prepared in case they do. And you're having basically volunteers or part-time workers that are the ones who are treating those customers. Everybody, uh, wants to understand the rules, but the average age and is, is 72 of poll workers in our country. They have very limited training um, and the rules are changing all the time and the machines are changing. Voters wanna get in and out in 10 minutes, ballots are long, uh, and the press wants to get results 30 minutes after the polls close. So if you think about all of that in a normal election, it's a little crazy to think about. And then you layer a pandemic on top of that and it makes it really mind blowing that we got through this as well as we did because we needed to have both safe and secure elections in the middle of that pandemic, which meant people wanted to vote in new ways. So rather than just on a Tuesday, people wanted to be able to vote at their homes or people wanted to be able to vote prior to election day so they didn't have to stand in long lines and be uh, subject to, to, to uh, getting infected. So that meant for election officials, huge logistical challenges of basically running two types of elections, one in person, uh, both before election day and on election day, and the other as a vote by mail election. Some of the states, four or five states out west have been doing vote by mail for a long time. It's taken many election cycles for them to get comfortable with that, but almost every state this year moved to it immediately. And this was huge because it meant in some places, you know, 3000% increases in dealing with mail ballots, uh, something that they just didn't have a lot of experience doing or the machinery or the staff uh, to handle. So um, combine that with all the last minute lawsuits and all the stresses, uh, I, I think we should be super proud of both the voters that turned out uh, in record numbers, but the heroics, I would say, of our election officials uh, who really pulled off uh, a safe and secure election in the middle of a very unusual time. So those election officials have a, had a lot more work to do this year compared to previous cycles. Uh, what are some of the tools and training that they needed to have in order to be able to accommodate all these new ways of voting uh, with the increased voter turnout? Yeah, so um, it, it, election, election officials know what they're doing, right? They, they, they know how to deal with voters, they know how to run their elections, but what they were forced to do this time is recruit a lot of new poll workers, right? Because if you have, the normal people who were working at the polls in a vulnerable category, they were not gonna show up. And so that meant recruiting a lot of new people, training those new people uh, and getting them in spaces that were gonna be safe both for the poll workers and the voters. So that was on the in-person side. 
Uh, and then on the vote by mail side, it was just an awful lot of new process about how as a voter do I apply to get my ballot? How is that ballot tracked to make sure that it gets to the right person? How is it tracked when it's back? How does a voter know that it's been returned properly? Uh, how do you, we had a lot of conversation this year about the post office uh, and, and, uh, and whether, whether ballots there were gonna be delayed or not. So a lot of election officials set up drop boxes to receive those ballots. Uh, not only was that a thing that they could have more control over, it didn't cost money for the voter uh, to put that ballot in the mail. So yeah, there were just an awful lot of new logistical challenges uh, that, that uh, election officials were up against. And as I said, I think, I think they did a great job. So the expansion of ways that people can vote uh, seems like uh, they were popular uh, in that we had a record turnout using this variety of ways to vote. Um, what are some of the concerns you have about if some of those expanded voting options stick around, um, that they might become, uh, they might introduce more risk into our electoral process, and, and what can we do to help mitigate some of that risk? Right. There's a lot of question this year about whether it was safe uh, to vote by mail, whether that was going to introduce fraud into the process. Um, look, voting by mail has happened for for years and years. We've we've been voting in America for more than 250 years. We've been voting by mail for many years, and in some states, they voted 100% by mail uh, for decades. So we know that it's safe. It re does require making sure your voter rolls are up to date, um, and so that's that's something that we need to invest more uh, time and money in to make sure that those lists are as clean as they can be. So when we know who's on the voter list. So I'd say that's the number one thing. Uh, but number two, um, having it be easy for people to get those ballots, right? Um, in some states, there were still requirements that you have either a witness uh, or a notary um, also validate when you do a vote by mail ballot. Uh, they're just very inconsistent rules across the country. In some places, it's convenient and easy and safe. And in other places, it's very difficult. And I think one of the big challenges going forward is to bring some more consistency for Americans across the country to make sure that they have these options, they clearly like them, um, and uh, that it doesn't have to depend on which state you're in, whether it's easy or hard to vote. By the way, can I just tell you that this is one of my big pet peeves. Do you all have any, re any idea why we vote on a Tuesday in November? A bunch of election geeks, you should be able to answer this question. I got nobody, you got nothing? All right, so here's the story. Tuesday in November was set up a long, long time ago because it was convenient. Why was a Tuesday convenient? Well, it was an agrarian economy. And during in an agrarian economy, you don't wanna have it during planting season or growing season or harvest season. So in most parts of the country, November was a good time. It was after all of that. So November made sense. And Tuesday made sense because people moved around in horse and buggies. And you didn't want to make people travel on Sunday, which was church day. Uh, and Wednesday was market day. So Tuesday was convenient because people could leave on Monday. It might take all day to get to the county seat to vote. So they set it on a Tuesday. Uh, it's obviously not convenient for people anymore, and we ought to be thinking of other ways to make it convenient for folks to vote. Well, the first step in voting is typically going to be registering to vote, and now so many states have moved to online voter registration, uh, and so having a database with that much information that is so critical to the process is obviously uh, a tempting target, uh, it's a tempting piece of election infrastructure that needs to be protected. Uh, Bruce, can you give us some of your thoughts on what does it mean to be able to protect that kind of data, but also make it accessible so that the election officials can actually have access to it and the voters can actually have convenient access to be able to register? The registration is an interesting process. Uh, many countries don't have it. When you uh, become voting age, you're automatically eligible to vote. Registration itself is a holdover uh, to, uh, to suppress votes that it, it's another barrier that people have to overcome. Uh, certainly disproportionately affects uh, those who are poor, don't have time. And right, it is a database of people who can vote. You know, US, we have a lot of, of databases of citizens. You can think of state uh, 
uh, databases of, uh, of people who can drive, of uh, national databases, social security databases, other databases for benefits. So it is one of those databases. And yes, it's vulnerable, right? The OPM database was, was hacked by the Chinese a few years ago. We know that Russians have infiltrated, although it seems not to have done any modifications to voter registration databases in the US. Uh, there's, a, there's really a lot of good work done by Latanya Sweeney and others. Uh, she's a professor at, at Harvard, looking at the security of those databases from changes. So one of the ways they can be attacked is someone can go in and change your address, your party affiliation, which will, which will affect uh, primaries. And we're trying to balance convenience. People want to update their address online, want to update the party affiliation with, with security. And, that, and there are risks there. So far in this year, we were worried that there would be attacks against voter registration databases which could result in chaos, where you go to a state and the road registration databases don't work. So many states have paper backups and other manual systems to try to uh, be ready for those kinds of attacks. So it is something we have to secure. It is certainly a risk, it's a worry. And when I think of the risks of voting, registration databases is one of the major risks. Uh, we were successful, perhaps we were lucky, uh, this year, I think we'll learn in the coming weeks, months, and maybe years, if anything was attempted and thwarted. But yes, you know, when we have a, a database of people who have a privilege, there's always the risk that that database will be hacked by people who, who want to abuse the privilege or deny the privilege or just sow discord and confusion in who has that privilege. So what are some of the ways that either local election officials or uh, other organizations can help strengthen that infrastructure so that they're better protected against attacks uh, against the voter registration databases or the voting machines themselves? You know, it, it, there are things you can do, but honestly, a voting official in Akron, Ohio against the government of Russia is not a fair fight. You know, so we, are, we do have this very distributed election system in the United States, right? 51 individual legal jurisdictions, local jurisdictions, where the rules are different, where the defenses are all local, and we're expecting them to defend themselves against nation states. So we can talk about computer security and things you can do, but really the best thing we can do is have some sort of national standards, some sort of national systems, because the threats are national. The distributed local nature of our elections was really well suited to the threats of the mid 1800s. And you know, it is secured largely against those threats. That's why we don't see the kind of retail voting fraud that, that's often talked about, people going in and voting twice, voting for other people. I mean, that kind of stuff tends not to happen. When it happens, it's very local. It doesn't change anything. It's discovered. It's, it's the major threats. It's the nation state threats, the computer threats against the machines, against the systems, against the infrastructure. And there, you know, we are seeing uh, the United States government, U.S. Cyber Command. In, in 2018, they did something offensive to thwart an election uh, fraud attempt by Russia. We don't know the details, but it seems to have involved going into the networks and computers in the Russian organization that was planning whatever they did and, and shutting things down. And that's the kind of defenses we need. And you're not going to have a local official do that. I, sh I remember sharing a stage recently with the person in charge of a state election talking about the briefings she got from her state's National Guard on phishing attacks. I mean, that's well and good, but again, not a fair fight. Yeah, can I just jump in and I want to just double down on what Bruce said. It's it, when you have things that are uh, national security threats done by nation state actors, you can't expect uh, some local election official to, to be up against that. Uh, and it makes total sense to have a national response. The good news is that after the, the threats that we saw in 2016, um, Homeland Security and uh, the Cyber Command really did step in and begin to support 
state election officials and local election officials in very new ways that had never happened before. Uh, they get credit for doing that. Um, I want to point out one other thing, and that is that um, when we think about elections and the ability for uh, bad actors to get in and, and change things, um, you know, the easy way to do that is through the internet, right? So it's the, it's the, it's the features of the election that are connected to the internet that make it convenient for voters when it's connected to the internet, but also makes it convenient for bad guys. And that tends to be a voter registration databases uh, and election night reporting type sites. The, the, the voting equipment itself, uh, the machines that you vote on and how those get tallied are not connected to the internet. Uh, they are very distributed and it's a very you know arduous and, and step-by-step process to tally those votes. Uh, but that's not something that's, that is connected to the internet and therefore has a very different threat profile than those things that are. Well, it certainly sounds like we're adding a lot of technology to the election process, but we're not necessarily adding a lot of uh, cybersecurity staff to that. So Jake, can you share with us uh, some of your thoughts on what it means to be able to support those state and local election officials, specifically when it comes to cybersecurity? Sure. Hi, um, and, and, and thanks for having me. Um, and, and, and by the way, let me uh, first just uh, um, shamelessly, uh, you know, thank our, our hosts for doing this and for what you guys do to support academia. Um, a little bit off topic from your question, but just to address, um, you know, the news from yesterday, uh, you know, we have, of course, had the president come out and make this completely asinine claim about the machines being hacked and changing all these votes. And then, you know, unfortunately, we had, I think, DHS come out and make, you know, a nearly as equally asinine claim that this is the most secure election in US history, when, as you're saying, there's all this technology that's added, um, you know, obviously the databases can be hacked, the websites can be hacked. We had elections 100 years ago before there were databases and websites, um, you know, and, and, and presumably things were actually at least more cyber secure back then. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we then of course have the far right who immediately, although they've been saying election security stuff is fake news for the last four years, agree with the president and the far left who do a 180 that have been saying, you know, election security is, is uh, um, you know, all Swiss cheese and immediately agree with Homeland Security just because they disagree with the president. Um, and I think what's really important is what academia does and what you guys are supporting, which is we take a long view or we try to, we try and say, okay, let's gather the facts and let's, um, and let's do some research and see, okay, is it more secure, or is it not? What do we need to do to make things more secure um, or uh, where are our holes and so on and so forth. And so, you know, I do think that academia has a serious role to play here. And I think, you know, your guys' support of academia in this conversation um, that is not driven by a media cycle uh, is, is appreciated and, and important. Um, so to, to get to your, <laughs> to your actual question, um, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges that election officials have um, is workforce. And it's, and it's not because of them. It's everybody has this, this problem in cybersecurity. There's um, the last estimates I saw said about 500,000 person shortage in um, uh, cyber jobs that are unfilled across all industries in the United States, about one or about 3.5 million globally um, shortage of, of uh, cyber professionals to open positions. And so you have, uh, you know, somebody in Alamakee County, Iowa, um, competing with JP Morgan and Google and Amazon and NSA and, and Cybercom um, for cyber professionals. And it's incredibly hard to compete for a whole host of reasons. Uh, so what we did is recruited um, uh, several hundred. In fact, we had to actually shut down recruitment after a certain point because there was such interest um, of uh, cyber experts uh, and got funding from multiple organizations um, so that we could uh, do background checks on them and a whole host of other things and provide kind of pro bono cybersecurity support to election officials um, uh, to, to help, um, you know, do some of the just basic cyber hygiene uh, that needs to be done in, in so many of these systems. Um, and so, for example, um, you know, we had 
one election official and, and we, we take, you know, their, their privacy and, and, and uh, um, NDAs and stuff very seriously, so I won't say who or where, but we had one election official who came to us and said, just basically, look, you know, the state controls a lot of my infrastructure and the county controls a lot of the rest of it, but I know I should be doing more cybersecurity. You know, I just don't know what that is. Can you tell me? Um, and so we um, connected her with some folks uh, who were able to go through like real basic um, cybersecurity uh, um, uh, protocols that she could put in place. And then we had somebody else who was um, really trying to look at um, addressing um, Secretary Carnahan's uh, concern about uh, voter registration databases. And so he was looking to move his into a more secure cloud than where it was, um, put blockchain um, on the database. We can debate the merits of blockchain and so on, but I think it's more secure than what he had before. Um, and so we had some folks who helped him do that in, in the most secure way possible. Um, and, and so, you know, and then kind of everything in between. So you have the, the people who are super um, uh, tech savvy trying to do, you know, really interesting things um, down to somebody who's just saying, well, can you just tell me what, what security I should be um, doing at the most basic level so I, so I can try and do that. And, um, you know, we, we were really, really happy with the results and, and look forward to, to um, expanding to more um, jurisdictions in the future. Because there's this this election, uh, or sorry, the cyber workforce problem is not getting solved anytime soon um, in any industry, not just elections. Uh, the banks and uh, military will continue to struggle with this for decades, as will everybody else who's trying to hire cyber professionals. And so, you know, we're just trying to to um, help uh, deal with it for for election officials as best we can. Well, that's certainly an interesting way to help address that workforce issue. And of course, that starts at the other end of the pipeline. How do you get people interested in cybersecurity, but also interested in doing something for the public good? I think this is where uh, Rich could probably have some uh, information for us about how do you re actually recruit students uh, to be able to work on these very interesting problems? Uh, please give us an example of that. Uh, sure, thanks. Um, uh, and, and thank you for the invitation. It's good to see everyone here today. Um, so we we just started um, uh, a, a school at Georgia Tech um, to to meet the, the demand that students um, um, have for for training in careers in in cybersecurity and you know some of this is driven is driven by um, driven by digitalization that takes place in in the commercial sector and the gov government sector um, we submitted a proposal to uh, um, to um, for a pit UN project this year to do COVID safe uh, uh, secure um, polling places and and kind of made a call to to students to uh, to participate in in that we had to shut off the call after we got 30 students um, uh, we just had no, no way of handling the size of the of the of the turnout that we got and so so what what that tells me is that. Is that there? There is there is a there is a um, uh, uh, there is kind of a, a, a student-led uh, movement out there to look at at um, at societal impact of technology and and to do that in a an election year, particularly this election year, j just just blossomed into um, uh, into a project that that was much bigger and much more um, much more widespread than we. Than we when we thought, um, you know, we we had we had some some support for the for the students, but to be honest, that most of the students that are in the Georgia Tech Safe and Secure Elections Project uh, are doing it either for credit uh, uh, or for um, for the um, uh, for the experience, and and I think that that's a resource to be to be re relied on. I, I've seen over the last last ten years or so. The evolution of students, even at a very, very nuts and bolts, pla nuts and bolts place like Georgia Tech, um, students becoming more and more aware of social justice as an issue, more and more aware of equity uh, as an issue, uh, and and this all just came to a head in in 2020. Well, Georgia has certainly seen its share of changes in the way that it actually holds its elections. 
Can you explain a little bit about how elections in Georgia specifically are different this year? And what are maybe some of the, the challenges or concerns that you're seeing on the ground as a result of those changes? So this is this is not the fight that I thought I was going to be having in in, in Georgia. Uh, when um, when we started um, uh, looking at at the new generation of ballot marking devices that that Georgia was considering back in 2018, um, we we thought we were going to be fighting a battle over hand marked paper ballots versus machine marked paper ballots and 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 voter verification uh, of of ballots and and We've been fighting that battle for for uh, for two years. It's, it's grown pretty contentious here uh, in the in the state. Um, and um, lo and behold, um, the world changed, uh, and and the things that we thought were going to be important turned out not to be so so important. Um, I will tell you that 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 about half of the ballots cast in Georgia. Um, this election cycle were handmarked paper ballots, uh, and and it had nothing to do with 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 uh, with our well maybe it had a little bit to do with with with, with our with our advocacy for uh, for safe and secure um, election technology, um, but it really had to do with 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 the way that the assumptions broke in this in this election. Um, we started calling um, voting in in the state omni-channel voting. Um, 18% of the votes in this election cycle were cast on November 3rd, 18%, um, which means what? Which means that, that, that early voting, kind of a, a mix of, of, of in-person voting uh, at, um, uh, at, at polling centers uh, and, and uh, handmarked paper ballots, the absentee ballots in the, in, in the state um, made up the bulk of the, of the way the votes were, were cast. We were planning. We were planning on a on a um, um, on a a massive turnout uh, in Atlanta um, after the the June primary. You know, there were New York Times articles showing these long lines, um, people waiting in line eight hours, ten hours to to, to uh, That's that's what we thought we were going to be going to be facing. Um, meanwhile, meanwhile, voters looked at that and said, "Hmm, I can see five other ways." To spend my time than than waiting in line for for ten hours, and they took it. And they, they took it. Um, we had we had the private sector stepping up. The the the, uh, um, the Atlanta Hawks uh, made State Farm Arena uh, available for early voting. Uh, that turned out to be a really really popular choice for for a lot of a lot of voters. Um, we had we had uh, drop boxes. I I, I think I think. Uh, um, Robin mentioned the, the appearance of drop boxes. Those were really, really popular. So as people began, began to hear that the mail would not be necessarily uh, the safest way to cast their vote, they drove 15 minutes to the nearest drop box and, and, used, um, and used that. Um, so, so all the models that we built, and we spent, we spent a lot of time modeling voter turnout and, and, and wait times. Um, uh, all the models that we built for the 200 polling places in Fulton County, which was our our, our focus area um, resulted in really, really good software tools that we will make available to to election officials, um, but but it turned out not to be not to be where the action was um, this election cycle. Um, and um, and I, I think I think the the idea that that the scenarios that you plan on um, based on historical turnouts, historical voter patterns, historical vulnerabilities. Um, Needs to be reexamined because because we're not we're not seeing traditional patterns um, for any time in the in the future. I mean, we we will have a January fifth runoff here in um, in Georgia, and heaven knows what the um, what the situation is going to be like for for that. But it won't be anything like what we've seen in in prior elections for this election cycle. Um, and then and then as you look forward, we're going to have to make some conclusions and make some some. Uh, reasonable predictions about where to put our resources going forward. Well, one option that's been noticeably absent uh, is internet voting. So people using their own mobile device or computer to be able to cast the ballot. Uh, obviously in Georgia, at least there was uh, a lot of voting that didn't happen on election day. And it seems like 
we are going to have uh, the impacts of COVID-19 felt for at least another election cycle, so people may be wary of showing up in person. Um, so is it now time to invest in internet voting? What does that look like? What are some of the risks and how can we uh, mitigate those risks? What are you asking? Yeah, I'll just say no. I'll, I'll just say no, hell no. Don't even think about it. That's idiotic. My God, run away fast. And we can expand just in, on that. Just, just, in case, that. just in case it's not clear, this is a really bad idea. All right, Jake, are you the lone holdout here or are you gonna jump on the bandwagon? No, I think, I mean, the challenging issue is there's like, you know, military and so on who vote over email and stuff like that, which is horribly insecure. And there should probably be a better option figured out for folks like that, that are already voting online. Um, but I agree with the group that there are serious security concerns in terms of doing this widespread, but we should find a more secure option for those that are already doing it. So this is actually important to talk about a little bit. I mean, so you asked a bunch of, of security experts that all told you not that let's work on it. There are trade-offs that told you don't even consider it. And this is not obvious to the average person because they'll ask, why, why can we bank online? Why can we do all these things online securely? We can't vote. So I want to take a second to explain. The problem is the anonymity of the ballot. That if, if, there, if we didn't have voter a, vote anonymity, voting online would be trivial. It would be like banking online. And you could audit it. If there are problems, you can undo it. Uh, you can make it public. You can check to make sure it's accurate. But the, the need for ballot secrecy means you have to have a clean break between whether you're allowed to vote and your vote. And because we can't even begin to trust the security of the objects you're voting on, the phones, the computers, the software, we can't make it secure. And even worse, if there is a problem, we could never know because we can't audit in the same way you can audit banking, where all names are known, all transactions are recorded. There is a database of what happened. So we can't do internet voting. We can't do voting by Facebook. It, it just isn't secure in ways that could be catastrophic and can't be detected. If I can just add to, to Bruce's comments, so, so the, the, the idea that that you should be able to vote using your, your mobile phone or, or, or logging into a, a web browser is based on a false premise. It, it's based on the premise that, that banking is secure. It's based, based on the premise that, 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 the, that these things that we think are secure are secure. But my goodness, you pick up any newspaper in any, any medium-sized city in the country and you're bound to find an article about some ransomware attack um, on, a, on, on a hospital or an individual or, or, or something that has caused people to, to, to lose something of value to them because they conducted that transaction on, online. And, and it's not that these are anecdotal stories. Um, the banking industry, the financial services industry, builds loss into its business model. The financial services industry subsidizes the losses in online transactions, just like they used to subsidize the loss in in, in bad checks that were um, that, that, that were passed. Um, you don't have that luxury in in, in elections. There's there, there's no one that's going to subsidize your lost votes. If it's five percent of the votes that that are are, are damaged uh, in online online transactions, those damaged votes are gone. There's nothing that you can do to. Um, to, to, to recover them. So I, 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 think, I think one of the things that we can do is start the discussion in an honest plane and, 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 and recognize that there is an inherent risk to vote, to conduct any transaction on, on, online. Uh, and, and, and then if you want to discuss from that point on, what might you do for voting? You're starting from a point where it's an inherently risky activity. Well, I think it's fair to say that no election is run perfectly. Uh, there are always cases of uh, interesting things or unusual things happening, and that's what makes election officials, you know, some of some of our greatest public workers, is that um, they have to have backup plans for their backup plans because 
things do happen. They have to expect that something will happen, whether it's a broken water pipe or it's a, a missing box or, uh, you know, the power goes out. And so I think what we've seen in the past is that whenever there's any sort of a, an audit or recount, there are some mistakes that are uncovered. So no election process is perfect, um, but we do accept some of that imperfection because overall it does work very well. Uh, so um, what level of imperfection are we willing to accept in moving to perhaps having some ballots come in uh, over the internet? It's less imperfection. So there are two types of failures. There's the, the failures you find in a recount. This ballot was done wrong. This ballot was done wrong. Right? The, 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 sort of the retail level, the individual level. But there are also systemic failures. Right? You get to the end of the day and the internet says it's zero to zero or a million to zero, or negative a million to negative a thousand. You could have these complete systemic failures where everything went wrong. So the, the computers fail differently than normal things. Right? They all work perfectly till one day when none of them do. And that's the kind of failures you're worried about when we say internet voting is insecure. It's not that this person's ballot will be recorded incorrectly. It's that everybody's will be recorded correctly. Right? Ransomware against the state. Can, can I just, I, I want to just jump in there on, on two points. One is um, we, we talk about the banking system and how convenient it is for us to do everything online nowadays. They do invest a ton of money um, in, in all kinds of systems and security, even imperfect as it is. It is very clear that we don't invest that level of money in our democracy. Um, we got $400 million last year out of the federal government for election security. Uh, and then maybe I think another 300 million this year, a lot of it came too late to be able to really be implemented. And so one of the best things that we could do is have some dedicated funding stream uh, to, to maintain our election systems and decide that it's worth it. Um, and not have this be this political football that always runs up to right before the elections. And then you've had three months before the elections, you've tried to get millions of dollars out the door. That's not how you run a good election. You have, it takes planning. It takes investing in, in your infrastructure and your people. Um, and last minute funding doesn't help that. So where should that investment come from and who should that investment go to? You know, you, you mentioned the uh, several hundred millions of dollars coming from the federal government. Um, and then the other end of that is that we've seen a, a couple of smaller companies like Democracy Live or Votes, um, you know, looking into uh, their own version of internet voting. Uh, we've also seen some investment from Microsoft through uh, their end-to-end -end verifiability research project. You know, is this something where the money should be coming from? state, local, federal government and going into the private sector or perhaps even into universities to continue this research to get to a point where we can have a high level of confidence in internet voting? Can I, can I, I want to say one other thing about this whole who, who ought to own election infrastructure topic. Um, I, I have strong feelings about this. Uh, when you have a, one of government's missions is to be able to run elections and outsourcing that mission to a bunch of private companies who may or may not uh, share all the same incentives is super problematic. Um, we saw this year in some of these states that you know, there were problems in their primaries. If many of them use the same election vendor, they're gonna have similar problems in other states and without a lot of extra money, uh, they are locked into whatever this problem is and have their hands tied in their ability to, to resolve it. So um, I, I'm, for, I'm for government owning their mission. Uh, and that means when it comes to elections, being the owners and being responsible for maintaining uh, the systems that run those elections. Yeah, and, market, and if I could just, uh, go yeah. ahead, Bruce, sorry. The, uh, I'll try very quickly. The, I mean, the, mar the market of internet machines, the companies that make these machines, is there, it's a kind of a screwy market. There's not a lot of motivation to make them better, to make them more secure. And, and uh, I mean, this is right. Having this in private hands is causing us a lot of problems that, that seem to be needless. Yeah, and I think, I mean, you know, piggybacking on what Secretary Carnahan said and also what Bruce said earlier about it's not a fair fight between a nation state and a, um, a county clerk. 
um, you know, as Secretary Carnahan said, you know, government should own its mission and the mission of um, national security is that of the national security agencies in the, in the US government. Now, I think local election administrators can still and should still administer the election. Um, however, it is the federal government's role to fund and um, help execute our national security. And this has become a national security problem. And therefore the federal government has to step up and fund the security. There is no um, you know, tax base out there that um, for these local jurisdictions that will ever enable them to spend the money they need to do anything close to the security that we need. And by the way, a lot of this requires, as I forget who was saying it, Bruce or Rich, um, deterrence, um, where cyber common and NSA need to go in and, and make the price of attacking our infrastructure so high um, that the bad guys don't do it. Um, and, and by the way, I think that that needs to go even a step further where the democracies of the world come together and say that any bad nation or any nation state that attacks any democracy is gonna face repercussions from a whole host of multilateral organizations as well as um, you know, potentially the US government or NATO or, or whoever. Um, and so uh, it, unless we're doing this stuff um, at this national level, um, again, not saying the federal government needs to come in and start running elections you know, um, at the local level, uh, then, then we're just not taking this seriously. So, so there's, a, there's a history to rely on here. Um, uh, the supercomputer market uh, is, a really, is a really interesting analogy to, to elections. So supercomputers were decided in the late 70s uh, to be um, to be critical to national security. Um, there's not enough money spent nationwide uh, uh, on supercomputers to be able to innovate at the level that you that you need to do it. So the federal government invested in in R and D um, to keep the U.S. supercomputer technology at the forefront of uh, uh, of, um, of, um, of what could be done. Uh, and 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 there's no there's no corresponding will or, or initiative on, um, on the technology that supports democratic processes, elections in, in, uh, in particular. Um, the entire, I mean, if you, if, you, if, you, if you believe the estimates, the, the entire um, uh, nationwide market for, um, for voting technology is $300 billion a year. Um, that's a really small number. Uh, and if you if you if you just did the 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 the, the net present value of a of a, of a research proposal um, into that into that marketplace, you simply don't get a big enough group funded on on R and D money to be able to innovate. Uh, and so so having the federal government step up with with a trusted source uh, of investment. Uh, regardless of who it goes to, uh, whether it goes to to private companies or, or industry, I think is the only realistic pathway um, pathway to, to get there. Otherwise, you're going to continue to see what you what you've seen in the in the in the past. Um, um, niche companies, um, um, manufacturing um, uh, components that have have low margins that, that don't have any particular um, uh, innovation. Uh, incorporated in in them, and 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 because because they're the kinds of companies, they they are pretty pretty inscrutable to to public um, to public um, uh, questioning, and and I, I, it, it's not that, that that there's not a way out of it, but 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 you you do need to have I think a sympathetic sympathetic federal source um, that's willing to listen to the arguments for why this is the right thing to do for the country. So one group of voters uh, that is typically overlooked but is still rather sizable would be the accessibility community. Uh, and this is uh, an area where we've seen uh, digital technologies over the past 20 years really make great advances to help people live their lives independently and privately, uh, which is something that the Help America Vote Act says uh, should be uh, the case in voting. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about how accessibility technologies tie into uh, the modern day voting process and what that means for security. Bruce, you're I am muted, which in November is an embarrassment. Uh, I, I, I can start. It's, it, I think that, that is important. Problem we had after 2000 is that uh, accessibility became a dominant uh, requirement and gave us very insecure 
uh, touchscreen voting machines. I mean, there are ways to build voting machines that are both secure with a voter, vir voter verifiable paper ballot and also are accessible and provide options for a variety of different abilities for voters, but you have to do that. And again, this speaks to the voting industry, which didn't have the incentive to build in both. And after 2000, we actually made things worse by putting in all of these touchscreen machines. And they are slowly being phased out in different states with machines that are more secure, that have a paper ballot, and also have more uh, a diverse set of capabilities for people with different abilities to vote independently. I, 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 think, I think realistically speaking though, Bruce, the, the, the amount of R&D that's gone into accessibility uh, uh, in, this, in this industry is pretty small. Um, the, 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 the studies, the studies are, are, are mainly vendor um, funded, funded studies. So, so you kind of have to set those, uh, set those aside. Um, the, the, um, um, what they tell you about accessibility flies in the face of, of, of other studies, other, other usability, um, usability studies. And, and this is one of the areas where, where I think rather than, than create a one size fits all solution that promises more that it can deliver to, uh, uh, to disabled voters, um, starting with, with almost a blank sheet of paper and, and building up accessibility models um, that are really useful and, and, and make use of what's known about, about the technology and incorporates the best cognitive science. Um, is probably the thing that we should be looking at. How long do you think it would take uh, before an investment like that uh, under those criteria would be able to make an impact and actually show up um, you know, in front of voters for an election? Well, they're, they're there already. Uh, dis disabled voters, particularly voters that, 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 have, um, that have visual d disabilities, um, um, carry their own assistive devices with them, uh, uh, and 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 to a large extent, the the the, the people that, that that go to vote um, uh, in in polling places um, either come equipped um, with with surreptitious devices that they use to to um, to figure out what's on the ballot, or with people that they trust that can help them um, that can help them along in the uh, in, in the process. It's not it's not it's not, it's not Frankly speaking, the major the, the major problem that uh, wheelchair accessibility to polling places is still um, is still an issue. Um, you know, I, I I went to you know 25 or 30 different polling places in Fulton County that promised uh, promised wheelchair access and turned out not to be the case. Uh, uh, and and you know the height adjustment that's supposed to take place on ballot marking devices to allow uh, voters uh, who are in wheelchairs to be able to access um, the, the the screen. Uh, are either not functional or or the 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 polling place workers don't know how to don't know how to activate the 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 equipment. So I think you have to take a look at the whole whole portfolio of, of, of what have a uh, um, uh, promise versus versus what ADA um, says you, you should you should consider and 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 find a way to 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 meld the two of those two of those together rather than retrofit uh, an existing technology to to something that may or may not be an issue. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and uh, move us over to a discussion on disinformation. Um, that was a major concern over the past couple of years, um, ever since uh, people were able to recognize the influence that Facebook and other platforms have on our, not only our everyday conversation, but especially our political conversation. Um, what did you all see uh, during this cycle in terms of attempts at disinformation, and if you could share what you think might have been the effectiveness of those disinformation campaigns. Well, so I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, so I guess there's two things that I was far more concerned about. I mean, not even uh, not even the same stratosphere as, you know, random tweets or whatever saying, um, you know, this, that, or the other thing. Um, were, were two instances. One um, here in Illinois, where someone put up a um, fake Facebook page that looked exactly like the Cook County Board of Elections Facebook page, 
Um, this is actually reported by NBC. Um, fortunately, the county caught it and got Facebook to take it down before they did anything with it. But we know this is something that, for example, Russia did, or, or not, the type of thing that Russia did in the Ukraine in 2014, where they hacked the actual, the real government website to change the election results. Fortunately, the Ukrainians took the website down, but then Russian media had announced their candidate won when in fact he hadn't and caused all types of chaos. So this attack that I think Secretary Carnahan mentioned at the beginning on these, these uh, you know, internet facing uh, websites and so on that are the actual official government websites that announce the, the unofficial results the night of the election, um, or for that matter, polling places, times to vote, methods by which you're supposed to turn in your absentee ballot, all that type of stuff, um, having those attacked I think um, is, is what I'm most concerned about and what we saw in the Cook County instance, but also um, in the Iowa caucuses, there was another even, I think um, maybe more insidious aspect of this. So um, as we may remember the election night um, reporting app crashed, the party says it wasn't attacked and so we'll take them at their word. However, um, the precinct workers for the Iowa caucuses moved to the backup as they were supposed to. Well, the backup was the phone and they were supposed to call in the results to the Iowa Democratic Party headquarters. Um, but lo and behold, none of us knew this at the time. On 4chan, um, somebody posted, hey, um, how about everybody call in the Iowa Democratic Party headquarters on, th on this time frame and jam their phone lines up? By the way, if you get through, give them fake election results. Um, and, and so, I mean, this is about as low grade and unattributable of a hack as you can, as you can do. Um, but we know that those phone lines were jammed all night. The Iowa Democratic Party actually even rolled their um, phone capacity over to the, the DNC, uh, the National Democratic Party phone uh, center. And then that was filled up uh, with calls. And, and then we saw, you know, what ensued was three days of basic chaos of the first um, nominating contest of the 2020 cycle. And these attacks um, um, that are essentially disinformation attacks on reporting election results, I think are were, were the two most disconcerting to me. If that becomes a trend, I think that that's really scary for, for how our democracy can un will unfold in the future, especially because they're just so hard to protect. I mean, uh, protecting a website is, is nearly impossible and, and these reporting apps and so on are, are uh, you know, very incredibly vulnerable. Can, can I just, I've got, I, I've got to like have one point here about this Iowa caucus conversation, which is uh, just reminding everyone that the caucuses are not elections. They are party activities run by political parties. So the Secretary of State and election officials are not involved in party caucuses. Um, and so none of the normal uh, election-based security measures and processes are used in a caucus. So I just, I, I wanna remind people of that just because it, you know, we, we tend to conflate things when they sort of seem the same, uh, but a caucus process run by independent private political parties is very different than uh, an official election. So Totally true. And by the way, we should totally, we should get rid of caucuses. They're terrible. Um, uh, that being said, with the exception of this year, at least the Democratic caucuses in Iowa have essentially decided the nominee in every election since Carter, um, with the exception of this year. So, but yes, they they are they are run by the parties. That's true. You bring up and an interesting they're... point about non-governmental entities having such a, an impact in our electoral process. Um, and that brings me to content moderation on social platforms. So think of Twitter, Facebook, Google, Snapchat. Uh, we've all seen how messages come through these platforms and whether they're uh, coming from legitimate sources and then are amplified uh, by malicious actors or uh, their provenance is suspect from the beginning. They seem to be having some impact. Those messages seem to be gaining some traction. And so as a result, we've seen uh, an increased number of these platforms labeling such messages and even pulling down messages. Uh, what has been your impression um, over the past month or two of seeing that increased activity of platforms labeling content as either being suspect or coming out right and saying, 
this is false, this goes against our policies and actually pulling those messages down or even um, uh, taking down the accounts themselves. Well, I, mean, I, I, just, wanna, I just wanna call, uh, you I'll start. jump in for one sec. And like as somebody who's been on the ballot um, a bunch of times and been involved in a lot of campaigns, dirty tricks and lies are, are not new. Right. This is a thing that we've had throughout our history uh, in, in, and happens in every country. Uh, what is different about this is the scale and the speed in which those things can move uh, and the anonymity. Um, and uh, for, for me, uh, I say it's about time uh, that these platforms take some responsibility for the things that they put up um, and, and begin to moderate these things. I, I, we can have debates all day long about uh, whether there should be that much power, uh, but there, there are ways that they can figure out when there are bots that are driving things that, or that there are fake news websites that have been put up um, that are based on you know, uh, things that have already been used uh, by the BBC or something else. I was, taught, I was taught in 10 minutes how to put up for 20 bucks a fake news website uh, by by someone, and I'm not even a technologist. These platforms know that they could they could do better at this, and I say uh, thanks for getting started, and we need to do some more. And, and the re the research really is, you know, thin is a bad word. We don't really know how effective any of this is. The the best work has come out of the Berkman Center at, at Harvard, looking at at 2016 and found that there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of things on Twitter and Facebook that seems to have actually changed no actual voters. So we see this, we are outraged by a lot of it. We don't know what's effective. We don't know what is working. Our Cory Doctorow ha ha believes that Facebook doesn't turn people into racists, it's turned racists into voters. And that is another way of looking at it. So we see these fake news, these fake websites, misinformation, lies, it's true this is not new, Speed, scale, and scope are very different, but we don't know if it makes a difference. I'm actually all in favor of platforms taking more responsibility for the things they publish, but we really need a lot more research on what works, what doesn't, what's real, what's a moral panic. And it's easy to, to, to guess, which is what most of us are doing. I think one of the complicating factors has been that, that that sources that you would assume in normal times would be trusted um, turn out to be not trusted, not trusted sources. So, so if you're inclined not to trust the government agencies' tweets um, um, or government officials' uh, uh, tweets, um, that may affect you, but it's not going to affect people that don't know that 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 that's not a trusted trusted source. Um, and, and that just seems to be a, a not a technological problem, not not something that we can that we can deal with um, by by adding another layer of security to to a social media um, platform and and um, it's just, it's a societal issue. I, I I don't know I don't know what we can add to the to the discussion there other than other than to to hold public officials to a level of ethical standards that's consistent with their job. Well, the National Association of Secretaries of State launched a trusted info. 2020 campaign to help get across to uh, the American public that their best source of trusted information is in fact their local election officials. Um, I did note that over the past couple of weeks that election officials were very active uh, anytime that they heard about any misinformation or even just questions from voters um, going around. They were quick to put up uh, truthful sources um, and, and contradict those misinformation messages and even contact the social media platforms to get those messages pulled down. Uh, like the example that Jake gave where if there's a fake page up, if the platforms don't pull it down themselves, um, then they're notified in an effort to get that down as quickly as possible. Uh, we've also seen the Department of Homeland Security uh, launch a rumor control page, which has been uh, referenced a lot over the past week or so. Um, even to the point of getting some senior officials in some hot water apparently. And this is something that's happening now where um, you have different parts of government saying different things uh, about the elections. Um, and so, you know, how do people uh, get a better understanding of where accurate information should come from when it seems as though 
different levels of government and even different officials within government um, are saying different things about the election and the results. Well, that's not a that's not a purely election related question. That is a how are we as a society going to decide uh, a common set of facts? Uh, it's it's a broader question about the media and the, the role of the media and actual journalists versus, uh, you know, citizen uh, with opinions uh, on the internet and um, the ability to easily differentiate something that is journalistic content uh, and something that is not journalistic content is something that, you know, we've, we've been able to do in other medium. You know, if, if, if a television ad comes on when we're watching the news, we can see that it's a television ad. We can see that someone is paying to persuade me for a thing because we present it in a different way. Uh, likewise, in a, in a newspaper or a magazine, advertisements are presented in ways that are different. One of the problems that we see with so much on social media is that the presentation between the news and the thing people are trying to sell or persuade you on is not very visibly different. So it's just a little harder to change. So I think that's just a broader question societally about how we, how we want to deal with this. Now, I, would, I would take social out of the description. Media in general, I, I, I think, deserves that kind of, of, of scrutiny. Um, local reporting um, that runs afoul of local officials uh, is, is sometimes modulated. Uh, and 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 that's not that's not good for uh, for transparency. Or if the local public broadcasting station feels that its 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 funding stream is threatened if if they delve too deeply into um, uh, into some sensitive sensitive matter, that's not good. That's not good for um, for transparency. And there's broader questions to ask of how we as society get trusted information. The census is supposed to be a trusted source of information that's used for a variety of different, uh, different government programs. And there is mistrust of that, mistrust of the courts, mistrust of the election systems. It, it's really very hard to build these trusted systems when so many things are untrustworthy. And I see my video seems to be down. It looks good from my end, so I don't know what's going on. Well, maybe there's some election hackers who uh, don't want people to hear what you have to say. Yeah, a little bit too late, isn't it? But okay. <laughs> They're attacking me, they're not attacking the important stuff. So that's good. So is this a case, uh, like we heard Jake say, where it's almost like national security, where it becomes a federal level issue because it does impact um, the ability to actually run elections nationwide and actually uh, you know, make sure that we have a firm foundation on which our democracy should be built, or is this something that should be better addressed at the local level uh, because it is those local election officials who have a higher level of trust uh, from their own voters. Um, well, I'll jump in. I mean, I, I think it's both. I think the local election officials, you know, should continue to administer the elections as they have. Um, but in terms of providing security, um, you know, both in terms of cyber hygiene um, and best practices and so on, um, at the very least in, in terms of training, funding, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then on top of that, what needs to be done globally in terms of cyber deterrence, um, you know, pulling together again, uh, the democracies of the world to kind of stand together on this and so on and so forth, that, that needs to be done at the federal level, in my view. So even though we haven't uh, actually finished the uh, 2020 election, I'd like for us to look forward. Uh, Rich mentioned that there's going to be a, a runoff in Georgia in just a few weeks, uh, but then we're also going to continue to have elections in 21 and 22, uh, and then looking forward to the next presidential election in 2024. So what are some things that we should expect would happen on the election security front in order to make sure that we're no longer repeating some of those mistakes from 2016 or even from 2020. So after every election, it's quite common for election officials to get together and do a bit of an after action report or retro about what worked and what didn't. And so 
I expect to see lots of interesting uh, new ideas and approaches come out of that. I will say that uh, in particular, we touched on this earlier, people are gonna wanna vote in new ways. I think that uh, this clearly opened up new avenues uh, for, for voters uh, and they're gonna wanna do that. And so I think on a legislative level, uh, there's gonna be a push to try to open that up uh, more clearly. I would say uh, the other thing that makes a lot of sense to me because we've seen so many differences in state laws and whether it's about voting hours or days or recounts or observer rules or whatever it is, some consistency uh, that is in uniformity about access to the polls, I think is really important. Um, we, we get our information nationally now instead of uh, from, from local sources. It's just very confusing uh, for, for voters and even for election officials to know what the rules are from one place to the next. And there's in many cases, not a lot of reason for it other than just history. And so I do think that it's time that we had some sort of baseline uh, uh, rights uh, uh, and accessibility rules for voters. Um, and now would be a good time to start that. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, this, I, I, I agree. I don't think we're putting this genie back in the bottle on, um, you know, everybody voting on one day you know, and potentially standing in line for hours and hours. Now that people have seen the convenience of of early voting, voting absentee and so on, I think they're just gonna demand it um, in the future. And then also, I think as Rich said before, and, and I think this really gets overlooked a lot, um, you know, the, the um, voting machine companies, they just don't have the margins to ever do the R&D that's necessary to really rethink um, and come up with a really, you know, definitively different um, voting technology uh, for the future. And, you know, I, I think that if we if we can get a bill in the next Congress um, and with the next administration, you know, hopefully they'll put real money, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars um, into, uh, you know, really uh, trying to, you know, give some of the best and brightest minds in the country um, uh, capital to, to really do some R&D and, and try and rethink the technology behind how we vote. Um, because there, there must be a better way <laughs> than what we're doing now. Uh, but it needs the R&D money to, to ever really come to fruition, I think. And by the I'm, way, I just put in a plug for if we do that R&D and the taxpayers pay for it, it would be great if the taxpayers owned it uh, or that it was otherwise open source rather than being turned into some sort of you know proprietary system uh, that is hard to change or access going forward. I t I'm oh, teaching a class actually in election security right now at, at Harvard Kennedy School. One of the questions that, that we discussed is how much democracy do we want and are we willing to pay for it? As are we as a society willing to pay for accurate elections? Other countries have a permanent bureaucracy in charge of safe and accurate and secure elections. Elections Canada, for example, the UK does, Australia does, Japan does. We don't have that kind of national bureaucracy like we have for our census. And sure, I mean, all of these suggestions I think are important and, and necessary, but are we willing to pay for it? I think what we want are perfectly accurate elections fast and free, which is impossible. So we have to decide this is worth it. If we get that level of investment, then how do we actually attract the talent that's necessary to the public sector, um, rather than having those folks go to some of the larger companies um, that were mentioned before? Well, I, I'm sort of embarrassed, as a, as a technologist, I, I'm sort of embarrassed to, to point this out, but, but what we tend to be attracted by shiny objects. Uh, uh, and and it's, it's true that, that a lot of the Western democracies use technology to, um, to conduct their elections, but a lot don't. Uh, uh, and and, and there's, there, are, there are a lot of low-tech elections where the outcome of the election is not a subject of, of debate because people filled out ballots by hand and they put them in ballot boxes and they counted them in community, community um, uh, events and they were recorded in, in, public, um, in public places. And, and I just, I, I think that, that there's a 
a point in this discussion where you have to say, have we used um, appropriate technology for the task that we're trying to um, trying to carry out? And it's not always the case. As someone who used to sell computer equipment to 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 customers who had to be convinced that they needed it, it's not always the case that you need the level of technology that we're trying to jam into this into this process. Um, and 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 that seems to be that seems to be an ongoing an ongoing conversation that has that has varying uh, levels of participation depending on on where you are in the country and and who you're talking to. Well, one place where it seems like the introduction of technology can be helpful is in uh, the area of post-election audits with this idea of a risk limiting audit uh, such that um, it's something less than a full recount, but can give a relatively high level of assurance that the outcome is confirmed. Um, do you think that RLAs uh, have a place in elections moving forward? Yeah, I'll weigh in on that for, for just a second. I, I think they're a great idea. Um, it's another way, it's another sort of belt and suspenders to, to make sure things are working right. And it gives people confidence uh, that, that the results are what, what we say they are. So the more we can do those things, the better. And uh, I think they've, they've come up with a smart process on these risk women audits. I agree, the answer is yes. And the way to think of it is it's an audit that size to the margin of victory, right? So if there's a huge margin of victory, you only have to audit a few ballots to ensure that there wasn't any kind of malfeasance because you have to change a lot of ballots to change the uh, to change the result. If the margin is very close, you have to do a larger audit because you only have to change a few ballots. So detecting it will mean you have to audit more. And so this ties the audit automatically to the margin of victory. You don't have to uh, uh, sue for a recount that happens automatically and statistics determines how we do it. And it's an, it is an excellent idea. I, I, I agree, Bruce. I, I think, I think the, the, the thing that you have to keep in mind, though, is, is that the math is non-trivial. Uh, and, and explaining what a risk-limiting audit is to even someone who's knowledgeable, uh, who's supposed to know what it is, is, is a difficult task. Uh, and and it's, it's, easy, it's easy to mischaracterize any old audit process as a risk-limiting um, audit. If you just kind of roll some ten-sided dice every once in a while and, and, uh, and have people make marks on on, on ballot manifests, um, and, and we don't we don't want that. So so you know coming back to who's who's the trusted source um, uh, on this is important. I mean, nuclear technology is complicated too, but we have the Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, that 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 we have pretty good confidence in in their their technical chops uh, in that area, and we sort of agree agree to have them think the deep the deep thoughts. Um, who, who is the technical uh, authority on risk limiting audits? Um, and maybe, maybe we need a federal agency uh, to, 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 to take on that challenge. I don't, I don't know, but, but it is, it's not a slam dunk, I, I think, to, to, to get people to buy into complicated um, models like RLAs and, 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 come away with a lot of confidence that, that the election has been correctly decided. Another trend in elections that is uh, seemingly complicated on the outside, but tends to make sense if you, if you understand it and you've seen it in practice, is this idea of ranked choice voting uh, is something that is gaining popularity uh, in some smaller jurisdictions, but not quite at the state level. We've seen Massachusetts and Alaska defeat initiatives, whereas it seems to be working smoothly uh, in Maine. So do you see a role for ranked choice voting that might help eliminate some of these issues of runoffs and get a better sense of um, the will of the public at a single moment of time, uh, rather than having uh, additional elections uh, down the road to help solve for those close races? I live in Minneapolis. In Minneapolis, we do ranked choice voting for, uh, for city elections. And yes, I think it is, it is a really interesting way of capturing the will of the voters, uh, potentially breaking the two-party system. It's really outside this seminar. It really has nothing to do with, with, with voting security or election security. But in terms of, you're right, capturing the will of the voters, it is a more, it is, it is a more robust and uh, expansive way of doing that. 
a little hard to explain. We had some trouble in Minneapolis uh, explaining how it worked, but now it's working just fine. Uh, Maine seemed to do, have done pretty well with it as well. Who did the explaining in Minneapolis first? Uh, it was done by the election officials, by the press, you know, because, because we had to have a ballot initiative to get ranked choice voting. So when it was being voted on, there was a lot of explaining by the media of what it is, what it is you're voting, how it would work, what it does, and it, it, and it did pass, which is which is kind of neat to see. Was there vocal opposition? There was. I don't remember the details. Yeah, I'm in I'm in St. Louis, and uh, this year there was an initiative on. I don't even know what they called it, but basically you could vote for everyone you liked. So you could have multiple votes or you could just vote for one. And I'm still a little unclear how that all is gonna work, but it passed. And so what this suggests is that the voters are looking for sort of new and interesting approaches to having their voices heard. And and that's one of the, there, we've talked a lot about the downsides of having such a disaggregated and federated system uh, of elections. But one of the great upsides is that we can have these experiments and see how they work out for voters and, and, and adopt them or not going forward. And that's exciting. I think that's called approval voting, where you, you vote for everyone you, 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 you like. Right. And yes, it's another way of, of yes. doing voting. Voting theory is super interesting if people want to start go to going down that rabbit hole. So it seems to me all of these local experiments are, are adding complexity um, in a way that will ultimately end up into something that uh, should attract more voters. Uh, but as we know, complexity is, is going to be uh, the enemy of security. And so I think trying to strike that balance is something that remains very difficult, both for uh, practitioners, but also for policymakers, because ultimately it's going to be those elected officials who are going to be setting the rules for how people vote. And I think it's incumbent upon the election officials to be able to uh, explain to the voters and to the policymakers the rules of voting. So that way we can reduce the amount of confusion and hopefully um, uh, contesting of votes further down the road. And I think that's where uh, technologists can come in, the folks that understand um, how the technology works and how it's supposed to be implemented uh, to make sure that we can have safe, secure, and accountable elections. Uh, we're coming up to uh, the end of time. And so I wanted to go ahead and give each panelist uh, about a minute to wrap up and leave you with something that they feel is critically important. Uh, let's go ahead and start with Robin. Well, thanks again for bringing us together here. I, I, I just hope people remember um, like that elections don't just happen. Um, they, we take them for granted, but there's an awful lot that goes into it. And we've touched on a little bit here about whether we think it's worth it. Like what, what is our democracy worth for us? What are we willing to invest in that? And what are the trade-offs to having the technology, uh, the convenience that technology can bring, um, but the risks that that brings as well? Those are not technology questions, those are policy questions. Um, and I think it's, it's a worthy conversation for all of us as uh, citizens to be thinking about how we want our government to work. Um, the Constitution talks about the just power of government coming from the consent of the governed. This is how we get the consent of the people uh, to set up our system. And we need to be rethinking some of those things. And so I'm excited to have uh, a, a new generation of people interested in this kind of public interest technology uh, and to be able to take up the cudgel and, and, uh, and, and join us going forward. Um, it's exciting, it's fun. Uh, and it needs your energy. So please join us. And Jake? Um, yeah, so a couple of things. One, of, I'd be remiss if I didn't shamelessly plug my book, uh, Democracy in Danger, um, where we talk about a bunch of these issues. Um, so please uh, go get it. Um, but secondly, I think, you know, we see, uh, you know, just over a week now after the election, you know, we find ourselves with, you um, you know, competing ridiculousness of the president claiming that all the machines were hacked and then Homeland Security saying that everything is the most secure, um, you know, election we've ever had. Um, and, and I think that what we really need um, now that we're gonna um, have a new administration 
and um, and and many new members of Congress and so on is to to really now get serious about this and from multiple perspectives um, in the coming uh, in the coming administration, which is one really focusing on uh, the R and D that can be done and should be done, I think, and funded by the federal government uh, to come up with the next generation of voting equipment that uh, I agree a thousand percent with Secretary Carnahan absolutely should be open source and uh, publicly owned. Um, and by the way, maybe available to the world, not just um, our own democracy. Um, and secondly, we need to get very serious about deterrence and pulling together de the democracies of the world to let everybody um, everybody else who would attack ours or any other democracy um, or their own for that matter, um, that, that this is not okay. And um, you know what we've done in the last four years, I think has certainly been progress without question, um, but there's so much more that can be done. And I think now that we're we can turn a page, we should, um, we should do that and, and really step up our game categorically. Rich? Uh, so I'm encouraged by the, by, by the discussion, a little daunted, but, but also, also in, encouraged. Uh, oftentimes discussions like this tend to drill down into a particular piece of technology, whether it's, it's uh, online uh, voter registration systems or, or voting machines or, or RLAs. Um, security is an end-to-end -end problem, uh, and 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 keeping keeping yourself aware of the context and 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 things like um, uh, things like um, the um, the political environment in which in which all this stuff has to fit is equally um, is equally important. So uh, you know I, I hope that we can keep in mind that that the ultimate goal is safe and secure um, uh, elections, and individual pieces may be faulty, that may be um, may be insecure. Um, other industries have managed to go through this kind of transition, and I think I think elections can follow that same path. Thank you, Bruce. I want to put a plug in for national standards and national systems. That uh, you, you often hear the argument that we are secure because we have 51 different election systems, and that's a standard argument in computer security: balancing uh, a distributed system versus a centralized system. Distributed tends to be better when you're as secure as the average. Centralized tends to be better when you're secure as the weakest. We're in a world where we're as secure as the weakest and centralized systems standards will serve us a lot better when the threats are, are so large. Uh, how do you do that in the United States? Probably looking at the same way you do uh, a national speed limit. The federal government had no ability to set a speed limit. So they tied the state's ability to set a speed limit with receiving funds for national funds for highways. We could do the same thing. If a state wants to get all this funding for election security, safety, reliability, machine systems, they have to adhere to federal standards. And I think we should look into doing that because the problems are national, they're not state level. Thank you, Bruce. I wanna thank everyone who's joined us today and especially thank uh, the staff of Pitt UN as well as the IEEE for putting this together. And I hope you all are encouraged and excited about getting into this field of election security because it's something that could certainly use your help and it's a great problem to try to solve.